Hey guys, and welcome back to WebMDNDM, where I talk about the tall tales that take place around my table while playing both games, the Dungeons and the Dragons. When last we left our heroes, the party comprised of Gurok the Orc Barbarian, Asuna the Elven Cleric, Leah the Elven Ranger, Elris the Elven Monk, and Asami the Dwarven Cleric had all been hired by the Red Scale Dragonborn and leader of the local Pelor Temple, High Father Kizuna Motorai, to investigate the disappearance of his friend, the druid Randall Marstag, who had gone missing north of maybe a month ago or so. Learning that the best person to talk to in this instance would be the leader of the Daylor tribe of barbarians in the northern waste, the party then set off and spoke with the chief of that tribe, Chief Grog Highclimber. Talking with Chief Highclimber, he informed them that yes, he did have information as to where Randall Marstag had disappeared to, but he was not going to share it unless the party did a favor for him first. He went on to explain that the Daylor Barbarian tribe had been suffering a lot of assaults from people living in the forest recently. Uh, a horned beast over in the north, orc tribes moving in off the plains, and a local goblins who had set up a camp not too far away. Chief Highclimber asked the party to go and deal with this goblin tribe and bring the chieftain's head back to him. The party agreed and were escorted to the goblin war camp by a couple of young barbarians. They set up, they waited for night to fall, after a short battle that then extended into a longer battle with a goblin patrol that unleashed a pair of wargs on them, the party decided that it would actually be a better idea to take a long rest in the barn, wait to recover their abilities, and then continue their excursion and in the day. However, a single goblin had escaped the battle with the patrol at the very beginning and gone and gotten reinforcements. As the party took their watches, they slowly realized that the barn was on fire and as they tried to escape from the barn, they realized that there was a goblin patrol waiting for them outside of the barn for them to come out, so that way the goblins could ambush them. And that's where we pick up today's session. The party is currently trapped inside of a burning barn with a goblin patrol waiting for them right outside those doors. Now it's time to roll initiative. First off, the heroes can hear one of the goblins reloading their short bow and lining up a shot for if somebody pokes their head back out of that barn door. Next, Gurak. He takes his great axe in hand, says enough of this and then leaps out of the hay bale door two floors up to the ground below narrowly avoiding getting shot by the goblin who was waiting for that as well as landing somewhat safely he then rushes towards the other goblins on their wolves and swings his axe down however the wolves are fairly dexterous and are able to dodge out of the way next up asami and leah who both take their bows in hand poke their heads out of the door take two shots. Leah is able to wound one of the goblins on top of the wolf, but she doesn't kill it. Next, the wolves rush at Gurok and try and tear into his flesh. While one of them is able to get a good bite in, neither of them are able to knock him prone. He is, stands tall and strong against their ability to throw people onto the ground. Next, Asami the dwarf runs over to the inside the barn and begins climbing down the ladder to land safely on the barn floor. Next, the goblin leader of this patrol, the one who was wounded in a previous battle, takes his scimitar in hand, kicks the sides of his warg mount, and rides forward to attack Gurok. As the warg bites down onto Gurok's bicep and draws blood, the goblin brings his scimitar swinging down, but Gurok is able to dodge his head out of the way. Elris decides to stay up in the barn with the rest of the elves, loads his bow, lines up a shot, and finishes the goblin who had been lining up a shot at the beginning of the round. Now at the bottom of the round, the remaining goblin on a wolf lines up a shot at the hay bale door. He believes that his leader will be able to deal with this foolish orc, and so is preparing to deal with whoever comes out of the barn next. Back up to the top of the round, Gurok brings his axe swinging around and slams it into the side of the war. However, the warg is a fairly hardy creature and is still standing after his axe bites deep into the side of its flesh. Asuna and Leah, both being fairly dexterous elves, move up, take their shots out of the barn door, and then move to join Asami on the floor of the barn to get out of the barn, which is slowly filling with smoke from being burned. The two wolves, one of them with a goblin rider, both try and gnaw into the flesh of Gurok. However, Gurak was apparently feeling very spry that day as he is able to avoid getting bitten by either of these wolves. Asami, currently on the floor of the barn, moves over and tries to kick the barn doors open and succeeds. It's a fairly easy door to kick open. But the problem is the reason it was so easy to kick open was because the door is also on fire. 
So as she kicks open the door, she exposes all of this flame to them, and they realize that to leave through the door will probably hurt. Not a lot, but it will hurt. Once again, the leader of this goblin patrol attempts to swing his scimitar around and strike Gurak, this time succeeding and taking out a bit of flesh in his right here. Gurak at this point is looking pretty wounded. However, he is able to successfully dodge the snapping jaws of the ward. Next up, Elris decides to risk leaping through the flames. Getting his robes a little singed as he does so, he lands, lines up a shot, and shoots right into the side of the warg. The warg is also starting to look really rough. And at the bottom of the round, the goblin who had lined up a shot on the hay bale door realizes that the heroes aren't coming that way anymore, casts it aside, and draws his scimitar to engage in melee. He brings the blade sweeping around his head and strikes at the back of Gurak, cutting him from shoulder blade to shoulder blade. And with that blow, Gurak goes down. Back up to the top of the round, it's Gurak. Gurak has to make a death saving throw, but luckily he succeeds. Next, Asuna and Leah both decide to leap through following Elris, take their bows in hand, and also line up shots. Asuna decides to line up a shot against the riderless wolf, whereas Leah decides to line her shot up against the goblin leader. And Asuna is able to hit the wolf. She doesn't kill it, but she does wound it. Next up, the wolves. With one wolf being both riderless and wounded, he turns tail and flees. The other wolf, with the goblin rider, seeing that the Gurak is now unconscious, turns towards the threatening characters who have just emerged from the barn, rides over and attempts to gnaw at one of them, and succeeds in taking a chunk out of Leah. Next, Asami and Elris. Asami leaps through the flames, sees Gurak unconscious, casts Healing Word on him, and then swings her warhammer around, striking the leg of the Goblin Rider. Elris drops his bow, whips out his quarterstaff, and smacks the Goblin at the same time. Between Asami's hammer and Elris' quarterstaff, the Goblin goes down. The Goblin Leader, seeing all of his Goblins lying dead, kicks his warg and charges towards the heroes, hoping he can still salvage this battle. The warg tries to tear into Elris, but he is a very quick little bugger. Goblin brings his blade swinging around towards Leah and is able to slice open her shoulder, but she's still standing. Back up to the third and final round. At the top of the round, Gurak wakes up from unconsciousness, picks up his great axe, and immediately charges towards the battle. As he does so, he goes into a blind rage, brings a great axe swinging over his head, and completely decapitates the goblin leader. Asuna and Leah both pull their short swords and stab at the wolves in front of them. With their leaders now dead and starting to sustain wounds, both the surviving wolf and the warg think that now is the time to get out of the situation. The wolf takes a disengage action and sprints away. However, before the warg is able to do anything, Asami gets her turn. And she turns with her warhammer and smashes it right down onto the warg, dealing a killing blow and crushing in its skull. With all the goblins lying dead and the heroes standing victorious, they all congratulate themselves on a job well done. And then the discussion happens as to why this happened. Some of the characters think it's just a random encounter, it just randomly happened, that you had no control over it. Other characters think it was a deliberate warning from the DM to not camp inside the goblin war camp, they should have camped outside where there wouldn't have been any goblins. You guys of course know the truth, which is that survivors went and got goblins and brought them there. It was not a DM warning that they should do one thing or the other. It was not random, it was a story-based moment. The heroes spend some time looting the bodies. They find a nice gold amulet, that seems to be worth some cash, as well as a little bit of silver in the pockets of the goblins. And they decide that with the barn burning, it would be wise to retreat from the area. And since they were trying to take a long rest and hadn't finished it, they'll retreat from the war camp, go back towards the forest, and set up a camp a short distance away and the rest of their watch passes uneventfully. They have successfully avoided being burned alive in the barn. As dawn rises the next day, the heroes take their time, learn their spells, ready themselves to head back into the goblin war camp and finish what they started. Moving quickly, they are able to return to the site of where the barn had been, which is now nothing more than a burnt out husk, and they have a little discussion as to what to do. Some think they should head down this path, others think they should head down that path, maybe they should go straight ahead. Should they circle around, be stealthy? Should they try and negotiate? Should they do this? Should they do that? After about 15, 30 minutes of discussing whether or not to take one path or the other, Gurak gets impatient. Gurak's character, Jesse, turns to me, the DM, and he says, I pull out my bagpipes and I start playing this as I walk towards the main castle. And I burst out laughing as he does this. Quite honestly, 
this was the single moment where I was completely surprised and I loved it. Like I will, there will be times when players do things I don't expect, but there are not times when I am completely surprised at what happened. And I loved it. It was one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. As a party watches this orc play the bagpipes, marching its way up the path towards the Goblin War Camp, some of them realize that it is actually the war song of the orc people, because why not? And they decide to go stealth and follow him to make sure he doesn't get in trouble, but far enough back that they're not involved in this little catastrophe. Something that I decided in the moment was that because he is playing a orcish war song, most of the goblins who would have been waiting for him or would have been attracted by the noise heard him and their cowardly nature won through and they decided to flee and hide deeper into the war camp instead of trying to confront an orc band that had come rampaging through. So Gurak continues his march towards the central stone keep where they believe the goblin chieftain is hiding. He is followed pretty closely by Elris, who again is a monk and can move very quickly in a single round. And then a little bit further back by Leah and Asuna, who are also fairly stealthy, and Asami, who is not very stealthy, but there's a lot of noise happening, so she's actually able to hide. As Gurak approaches the central hill of this village, seeing the stone keep before him, as well as a fairly intact stone wall, though there are... Uh, gates and holes in the wall, he notices that there are about two or three goblins on the wall with bows in hand as well as a pair of wolves on chains in front of the gate. He is in broad daylight playing music really loudly so the goblins can very clearly spot him. And they start calling down to him in goblin. They ask, who are you? What are you doing? Why are you here? Because they are about as stunned as I am. <laughs> Gurak responds that he is here to negotiate. He has brought a tribute to give to the chieftain. The goblins ask him, what tribute? And Gurak responds, only for chieftain. And I figure that called for a persuasion roll. He rolled badly. Not natural one badly, but bad enough. So the goblins don't believe him, ready their bows and say, leave now or we will open fire. Elris, seeing that Gurak seems to be in some trouble, begins moving up towards him. However, his stealth check did not beat the goblin's natural perception, and so they immediately spot him. And Gurak realizes the jig is up, draws his weapon, and prepares to rush forward. And once again, it is time for initiative. One of the goblins leaps off of the stone wall, does a little acrobatic roll in front of the two chained wolves, and prepares to kick the lynx out, which will release the wolves towards the heroes. The other goblins line up their shots, take shots, but miss. The heroes ready their weapons and they begin rushing forward. Leah, Asuna, and Asami are a far distance away, so they've got to move very quickly to try and get involved in this battle, but they'll be out for the first two rounds. Elris takes his quarterstaff in hand, readies himself to fight these wolves, rushes forward, and strikes twice with his quarterstaff, pretty much knocking the wolf unconscious. Gurak also rushes forward. He pulls a javelin, throws it at the goblins up on the wall with the bows, but unfortunately it glances off of the crenellations. Back up to the top of the round, the goblin kicks out one of the lynx on the other wolf and it rushes forward to bite into Elris, but misses. Goblin on the ground pulls a scimitar, also attempts to engage Elris, and is actually able to succeed, just barely. Two goblins on the wall take their bows, line up shots, and plink two arrows into Gurak. Gurak rushes forward, great axe in hand, and immediately beheads the wolf that was still standing. Elris turns his attention onto the goblin who was on the ground facing him, and with one quick flurry of blows, he knocks that goblin to the ground. At this point, the remaining three heroes emerge onto the battlefield. The two goblins line up their two shots and attempt to put Gurak down, but he is full rage at this point, and our, these arrows are just pinpricks, nothing major to him. Gurak once again takes a javelin in hand and tries to hit a goblin, but he once again goes flying off the crenellations. Elris turns, lines up a shot with his bow, is able to wound one of the goblins, but not put it down. Leah and Asuna now rush forward, and they are very good shots. So as they move forward, they take their shots and are able to put one of the goblins down with their combined fire. Asami, with her short dwarven legs, rushes forward, but she's too far away to do any spellcasting, and her turn is over. The final goblin, seeing that his allies are now dead and he is the last one standing, tries to flee. Leaps off the stone wall, lands on the other side. 
However, the portcullis that is between him and the heroes has fairly large squares and three elves all line up shots and put him down with a single volley. So it was a fairly short battle, not a lot of intense things happened. The heroes regroup, realizing that they are now a very short distance away from the central keep where they believe the goblin chieftain is currently inside. As the heroes are discussing what to do, they decide to send Gurok a little further ahead to investigate and make sure that the inner bailey is secure. Gurok agrees and he moves through the opening in one of the stone walls. As he does so, he can see that there are a couple of small buildings inside. Uh, one of them appears to be a empty stables with open walls. Another one appears to be a sort of closed off little, uh, a rather large hut. He moves over towards the window to see if he can peek inside and see what's going on. As he peers his head inside, he can see there's this one goblin dressed in like a tattered black robe with a hat and like these big spectacles, as well as another two goblins were dressed in common goblin fare. And as Gurok peers into the window, the goblin with the spectacles on his head and a potion in hand turns and locks eyes with Gurok. And as they lock eyes, the goblin says, Intruders! And that's where I ended this session. From one cliffhanger to the next. So Gurok, maybe about 60 feet ahead, not a huge distance, but a significant enough, is now caught the attention of some sort of alchemist goblin, as well as his two cohorts. So if you want to find out what uh, special brews the goblin alchemist has been churning up, you're going to have to tune in for the next session. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know down in the comments below what did you think of the Burning Barn. I had all sorts of stuff written up if they decided to stay in there for too long. Uh, after a certain amount of time period, the barn was going to start collapsing. Uh, smoke was going to start becoming a problem, but none of that really mattered. They were able to successfully get out very quickly. Uh, what would you guys have done differently? Uh, what do you think the Goblin Alchemist is capable of? Uh, how do you think I homebrewed him? Spoiler alert, I didn't. I actually stole it off of the Unearthed Arcana Reddit, which is a fantastic source. They do a monster a day where they make monsters for you to use for just this sort of scenario. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Be sure to roll your charisma saving throw against that subscription button. I look forward to reading your comments down below. I hope you all have a lovely day, and until I see you next time, take care.